Also tonight, torture, rape and deliberate starvation. An exclusive undercover investigation by Newsnight reveals evidence that the Ethiopian government used millions of pounds of international aid to punish their political opponents. We also investigate allegations of human rights abuse. They were beating me while I was being raped. I was bleeding. I became unconscious when I saw my unborn baby. I'll be speaking to a senior Ethiopian diplomat. And is the death penalty back on the agenda? As a cascade of e-petitions pings into the government's inbox, will politicians really take any notice? Good evening. Just when we hoped it might get better, well, just a little better, it got worse. In fact, if the markets are to be believed, the West could even be hurtling towards a second recession. There was carnage on trading room floors around the world as the markets went into free fall on fears that the Eurozone debt crisis could spread. In the US, the Dow Jones plunged by over 500 points tonight in the biggest sell-off since the credit crunch brought the global economy to its knees three years ago. In the UK, the picture wasn't much better, with the banks taking the biggest hit. Government banks Lloyd's came off worse, losing over 10% of its value in a single day. Andrew Verity reports. It wasn't supposed to be this hard on the markets, and it definitely wasn't meant to be the worst fall in London since the depth of the recession. Could we be going back there? Now is focused on the crisis in the Horn of Africa in an emergency appeal to save millions from starvation. But apart from this money, countries like Ethiopia are given billions of pounds every year in longer term aid to try to pull them out of poverty. Tonight, an investigation by Newsnight and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism looks at allegations that this money is being misused, that the Ethiopian government is using it as a weapon against the opposition, mad with systematic torture and rape to cow the population. Angus Stickler reports. The Horn of Africa, a humanitarian crisis on an unprecedented scale. Every day, thousands of refugees are fleeing to northern Kenya from Somalia and Ethiopia, walking miles to escape drought and famine. Children, the old and sick, are dying. <coughs> it's images like these that have prompted the international community to pour millions in emergency aid into the region. But this in itself is a drop in the ocean. Separately, every year up to $3 billion in long-term development aid is given to Ethiopia alone. In this special report by Newsnight and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, we expose evidence that the West has turned a blind eye to systematic human rights abuses in Ethiopia. I've given up on the West. I do not believe that the West is interested in democracy, the rule of law and human rights in the third world. <laughs> We reveal evidence of how aid is being used as a weapon of oppression, propping up the government of Melez Zanawi. Development is only available to those people who support the regime or who vote for the ruling party. The rebels began pushing in through the suburbs at four o'clock this morning. And the sky was Melez Zanawi came to power after ousting the Derg military regime in 1991. The priority will be to ensure law and order. But the crunch came in the elections of 2005. A brutal crackdown. 193 civilians died. Tens of thousands were detained. He remained a friend of the West. And allegations of human rights abuses continue to this day. In progress, through democracy. In 2007, the Ethiopian army launched a counter-insurgency campaign in the Ogaden. Human Rights Watch and the American Association for the Advancement of Science produced before and after satellite images of villages razed to the ground. 
allegations that Ethiopian troops were forcibly displacing entire rural communities, destroying dozens of villages. The media and most aid agencies are banned from the region. We decided to find out what is happening now by talking to those who've recently fled to the refugee camps of northern Kenya. This is Dadaab, the largest refugee camp in the world. More than 400,000 people live here. It's a sprawling refugee city. The vast majority are from Somalia. Thousands are arriving on a daily basis, escaping the drought and famine. Ethiopians are coming here too. Civilians caught up in fighting between armed rebels and the Ethiopian military. We've been told that the number of Ethiopian refugees arriving here is increasing by the month. Now we've spent the last few days trying to track some of them down and we're hoping to meet them here. This grandmother of four arrived just three weeks ago. She was arrested along with 100 others. She says soldiers killed her son in front of her. Whenever there is fighting between the two, they go to the nearest town and take their revenge on civilians. They would kill or arrest everybody. She was jailed for one and a half years. The women kept in a container, picked out on a nightly basis to be tortured. They raped me in a room. One of them was standing on my head and one tied my hands. They were taking turns. I fainted during this. After that, they threw me into the container. I can't say how many, but there were many soldiers. I can't estimate the number. A mother with a young child. Again, stories of rape and torture. There were more than 50 women in prison with me. We all experienced the same sorts of things. I gave up on life. I thought they were going to kill me. You don't worry about rape when you have no hope. This woman says she was arrested and accused of being a supporter of the rebel militia, the Ogaden National Liberation Front, declared a terrorist group by the Ethiopian government. She shows us the marks and scars of torture, stab wounds from a bayonet. They used to beat me. They used to do whatever they like, and then they started raping me. They were beating me while I was being raped. I was bleeding. I became unconscious when I saw my unborn baby. And you were eight months pregnant at this time? Yes. A man stamped on my stomach. You can imagine what happened to the child. Very big kicks. Blows with the butt of a gun. As a consequence of that, the child died. Independent sources have told us similar stories of widespread human rights abuses. There's no way that we can verify these stories and the press can't operate freely in Ethiopia. So we're going to try and go in undercover. Away from the drought and famine, the rains have come to Addis Ababa. It's difficult to operate here. It's a virtual one-party state and dissent is not tolerated. We arranged clandestine meetings with key contacts. Ethiopia receives approximately $3 billion a year in long-term development aid. The UK is the second largest donor after the US. This year our budget tops £290 million. The Ethiopian government controls much of the distribution. Almost all of this aid goes through the government channels. They have uh, the government uh, cadres and administrators 
have the, have the last say on who gets and who does not. The motivation is uh, buying support. That's how they recruit support. And, uh, you know, holding the population hostage. We traveled to the southern region. It is surprisingly lush here, but this is deceptive. The rains have come late and crops have not yet matured. Could you tell me what the, the wife of this village elder died just a few days ago. The reason, he says, chronic hunger. Five old people and five children died because of the famine recently. There are many children begging in the towns and on the sides of the roads. They're struggling to survive. <coughs> <coughs> this woman is a widow. She has seven children. The older ones have gone to town to beg and scavenge scraps from bins. This year there has been no help, no intervention from the government. What are your fears for your children, for their future? God knows. If they survive, they might find their way or die of poverty. What can I do? I give my children water boiled with the leaves from coffee trees as a tea and a sort of grass that is meant for the animals. That is how they are surviving. Another village 30 kilometers away. It's a similar story. We spoke to the villagers. Some had not eaten for four days. They told us they've had no help from the government. In 2005, the people of these villages voted overwhelmingly for the opposition. And according to our sources, they're still being punished now. We travelled 100 kilometres north to meet with others, farmers who say they too have been targeted because of their political beliefs. It was too dangerous to meet in their own village. They walked two hours across country to meet at a safe location. Because we are in the opposition, we're not able to survive in our country. Our integrity, our conscience does not allow us to join the ruling party. For these reasons, we suffer greatly. We suffer if we want to get fertilizer. I think that their spy is here. Is that him? Is it safe? It is not safe. This is not safe? Uh, and now uh, we can divert. We've had to cut the interviews here short. Uh, we've basically been told that we've attracted too much attention and that it's no longer safe to continue here. But these people here, these farmers, have told us how they've been denied fertiliser, seed. They've had their land grabbed from them. That Such is the situation that their own wives are leaving them and they've been completely ostracised from their own communities just because of their political beliefs and the grip that the regime has on the communities here. Opposition leaders say they have personally brought evidence like this to the attention of the international community time and time again. Their position of the normal community is dismissive. They, th they think, I mean, they always want to uh, dismiss it as, uh, as an isolated you know, incident when we present them with some proof and we challenge them to go down and check it out for themselves. They don't do it. A traditional funeral further north in Aromia. This is Ethiopia's largest and most populous region. In the last few months, more than 200 political activists have been detained in a series of mass arrests, many detained without charge, accused of being members of the Oromo Liberation Front, an armed separatist organization again declared a terrorist group by the Ethiopian government. This is a teacher, why you go? Professor Marera Gadina is a seasoned national opposition politician with his roots firmly in the region. He says the government is rounding up members of his and other parties, accusing them of being terrorists. Hundreds of them are now in prison, our members. The government knows our members, but uh, 
So the Sakuri simply say, oh, they are members of the other party, the outlawed party. Uh, you're saying these are innocent people that are being yeah, jailed no, because we of We know their own members have been in parliament, some of them in parliament, some of them in the national parliament, some of them were in the regional parliament, some of them were uh, ca our candidates last time during the elections uh, in the Seoul. And what happens to them in jail? Uh, well, some of them are se severely te tortured, severely tortured. Back in Addis Ababa, it's here that some of the worst human rights abuses are alleged to be currently taking place. This is the Matalawi prison, and it's here that opposition politicians, academics and dissidents are interrogated. This man recently fled from Ethiopia after his release. <laughs> Interrogation starts with beating. They handcuff your hands and feet and hang you upside down and immerse you in water. And they use electric shocks. This man was a senior opposition politician. He was in terror. A police said, hey. Just remove your trousers. Just beat him, kicked him, and then finally, you know, and then they took his uh, penis, and then one police with a cable just beat like this, and then you will never produce again. You will be castrated. The Ethiopian Human Rights Commission recently published a report into conditions in 35 prisons across the country. It says there is no evidence to suggest that inmates are subjected to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. The international community funds the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. Last year the UK's contribution was £230,000. Professor Mesfin Walder Mariam is an internationally respected human rights campaigner. If really they wanted the uh, Human Rights Commission to work uh, justly, uh, legally, I think there is a lot to be said. But these are cadres who are appointed to the Commission. They are puppets, absolute puppets. You know, you know, generation of uh, people are, you know, beaten. Um, some of them even lost their lives there. Uh, and we challenge a lot of uh, diplomats, including British diplomats, to get access to what is going on. There. And what is their response? Well, they say the government um, said this is interference, the government said that, the government said this. More of apologetic, you know, not really pressing hard to get uh, what is going on. They need to think much more strategically about how you engage with a country that fundamentally um, disrespects human rights. How do you make sure that you know, aid in that context actually gets where it's supposed to get? It's a very, very hard question to answer. The purpose of development aid is to help Ethiopia onto its feet, to establish democracy, justice and the rule of law. The evidence we've gathered suggests it's failing. Angus Dickler will join me now as the Ethiopian Deputy Head of Mission to the UK, Ambassador Abdi Rashid Dulani. Um, Ambassador, uh, first of all, um, what Angus Stickler discovered was human rights violations that were systemic, um, widespread abuse, uh, widespread torture. You know, a pregnant woman uh, raped and tortured a grandmother in the refugee camp who said that she was raped. Um, another woman who was stamped, her stomach was stamped on. What do you say to that? And uh, first, uh, thank you very much actually for uh, allowing us actually to explain. Uh, but uh, first, I want to uh, indicate that uh, this is uh, completely uh, a report actually that lacks uh, objectivity. Uh, it also lacks even-handedness. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, it solely 
uh, got actually the source, uh, the source actually which it used are an opponents of uh, Ethiopia who have been rejected uh, by the electorate and who uh, have been uh, time and again uh, have already uh, shown uh, that uh, uh, their allegations are unfounded. If you look at, uh, for example... Uh, do you disbelieve this these women? Do you disbelieve these women were uh, raped and tortured? One had bayonet marks on her feet and she said, these are not, these, these, are, are, these are women and grandmothers. These are in the Dab refugee camp. Pardon? These are in the Dab refugee Only camp. Only one. The others were within the country. I don't think so. But it's, they were. It, it, Angus Stickler... No, no uh, he reported. said actually that he was reporting actually from the Dab refugee camp. He spoke to one woman in the Dajab refugee camp and he spoke to others within the country. Ambassador, the point but, is but, surely but, but, that but, these, but, but, these women, whether these women are opposition supporters or not, presumably you condemn any kind of torture or abuse. Yes. What I, I was generally talking about the report. As far as actually uh, torture and rape is concerned, the Ethiopian government is a government actually uh, that is governed by the rule of law. Uh, that human rights and also uh, democratic rights are enshrined actually within uh, the Ethiopian constitution. So Therefore, what happens, so what happens in prison then? Because in the prison in Addis Ababa, we heard uh, that in Malawaki what? prison, there, was, there were men that had their heads held under water, that whose genitals were smashed, who had uh, electric currents put through their body. But these are completely a rehash and recycling of old allegations for which actually my government has time and again and repeatedly has given actually answers but to. But what about having a, a UN special rapporteur on torture to go into the country and look around the prisons and speak to people? What about that? What I'm saying is, for example, look at uh, your, your reporter who was actually saying that uh, uh, reporters are not actually allowed. And he was reporting actually from Addis Ababa. Yes, but he, he got wait, in wait. secretly. He was reporting from... He, um, he was undercover he was, ambassador. No, no, no. He was reporting from um, Oromia. He was also reporting. What I am saying is... But ambassador, can, very I, can recently, I just tell you, he was Very undercover. recently, one of actually your reporters, Mike Woolrich, was actually in the Ogaden. Was he rejected actually to enter the country? He yes. has been there. He was actually reporting in... But Ambassador, can I just be quite clear about this? Because it's very important that you understand the BBC's position on this. He had to go in undercover. He, was ref he would not have been allowed entry but into who Ethiopia. who are his sources? His who sources took him, are the people he who spoke to. Who took him in, inside the country? ONLF and o OLF. These are actually two organizations for which he was taking as a source. Can I say that he spoke to many, many villagers and he spoke to scores of people. And there's one, one particular point. Let's talk about the farmer who said that he had neither fertilizer nor seeds. And what Angus Stickler found when, he's, when he visited villages was that one village would be essentially on the edge of starvation and there was no crops and so forth. The next village, people were not starving. They were not prosperous, but they're not starving. And the village that was in much greater trouble was a village that was, had opposition supporters. The village that was looked after better was a government-supported village. Do you deny that? Yes. I completely actually deny it.